getting back into talking about developing our soul in the things of the spirit because again our born again spirit our spirit is born again it's fine this body is going to go back into the ground what we need to do is develop our soul and the reason why is because we have an inherent flaw with our soul and it tells us again this is just kind of remind us where we're at and where we're going here but in Jeremiah 17 9 it says this the human mind is the most deceitful of all things it is incurable no one can understand how deceitful it is we're easily deceived we're easily taken advantage of we easily believe a lie because we want to give people the benefit of the doubt and I've told you before that's what the enemy banks on he banks on this flaw functioning in your life he banks that you're going to believe the lie because he knows our heart is prone towards deception but not only being deceived but also deceiving others that's why you don't have to teach a two-year-old to lie it's ingrained it's inherent in the soul we try to teach him not to lie so again we've got to understand what the problem is or an inherent flaw that the devil plays on in our life we're easily deceived but not only that we found out what the solution is in Romans 12 too and again we talk about all this that's why I'm just reminding you catching us back up to speed Romans 12 2 this in the passion translation says stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you stop mimicking the culture around you but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit now you can't be inwardly transformed until you have the Holy Spirit you got to be born again this is talking about folk being who are born again if you claim Jesus is the Lord and you're born again then you need to function in this area of being transformed transformed how through the total reformation of how you think how you think in this natural realm is not how a spirit being should speak to think in the spirit realm two different places that's why a lot of all prayers don't get answered you've been taught how to pray you get no result in prayer that's why because you've been taught in the natural realm the natural realm doesn't work for spiritual things so again as a reminder Friday night this Friday night prayer and worship here in the house and can I encourage you please maybe speak up when you hear and pray not just me we're here to pray now if you're praying silently fine you you engage God how you want to engage God but pray get stuff see stuff engage with the spirit realm that's why we set it aside once a month to come worship him corporately pray together corporately and see things happen do you understand those folk out there want to know God's real and the only way they're going to know God's real is through you they have to see God working in your life if you look like they are they look or you look worse than they look what are they going to want if you're out there griping and complaining just like they are about everything what's the point so again these are just common sense things that we got to understand the solution is a total reformation of how you think that means you get rid of the old program and you put in a new program so the practical point we're talking about the very first practical point on how to develop our soul is we must make a habit of reading the Word of God being a persistent reader of the God becoming an avid reader of the Word of God however you want to put it learn to read the Word of God from a re revelational posture is how I put it see people read simply to read the words to gain intellectual knowledge I don't want intellectual knowledge I want revelational truth that's going to transform my mind to think differently so I can behave differently and act differently nothing is ever going to change in your life until you think differently about that thing I've told you before all the time about exercise very easy thing first of the year we go to the gym and the club is packed come March 1st or so it starts thinning out why did they all have good intentions certainly were they all motivated certainly 
But what was the problem? They never changed their mind. They were going to institute exercise into their life instead of changing their lifestyle with healthy habits, one of which is exercise. That's why they peter out. They never change their mind. That's why your faith walk peters out. You don't change your mind. Is God real? Is he there? Does he only have good thoughts for you? Does he answer your prayer? Does he comfort you in your time of need? See, these are all understand. We can read it in the book, but many times people say, well, I've read it there, but I haven't seen it in my life. That's because your mind hasn't been transformed. Because once you come to that place of transformation and walking by faith without any kind of doubt, it happens. So the revelational posture, to put it that way, I might start using that phrase, because how many times have we read 2 Timothy 3.16? This is in the Amplified Version. Let's just throw up the next, next slide is where we're going to get to here. 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, Every scripture is God-breathed, by, given by his inspiration. When was the last time you even thought of you're holding your Bible, you got Jesus in your hand? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. The Word is Jesus. It's not a book that He left, just like any other textbook that we can read. No, you are holding God himself. And some of you are tweaking about that, but you, that's because I'm talking about you need to change the posture in which you read the word. These are the very words of God. As if God was sitting right next to you speaking in your ear when you read it. And then it goes on to say, and is profitable. It says, for instruction, for reproof and conviction of sin, which we've already talked about, for correction of error. We've already talked about those. So we're not going to re-talk about those. But now I want you to catch this. The natural realm has programmed us to believe that these profitable principles that we've been looking into are actually bad and painful for us. They're to be avoided at all costs. Being called on the carpet, told that we've been done wrong when correct and then corrected for our wrongdoing somehow is a negative thing. We look at it that way. We want to avoid correction. Oh man, do you understand God corrects you for one purpose? He don't want you going to hell. He got to keep you on the straight and narrow. Why? Because broad is the way that leads to destruction. It's the straight and narrow that leads you to Him. God is all about getting folk to heaven. Making sure they get there. Why? Well, look at Jeremiah 29, 11. New Century Version says this, I say this because I know what I am planning for you. Do you know God has plans for you? God wants you to do great things. Just like we, may, we sang this morning, we were made to thrive. We were made to be the blessing. We were made to be the head, not the tail. We were the ones to be blessing and giving to others, not looking for them to give to us. We are the blessed. We are the children of God. We're the child of the King. People ought to be coming to us and looking to us for the answers because we were designed and made to thrive. And this is what God's reminding us. I've got awesome plans for you. Don't you know this? I have good plans for you, not plans to hurt you. God never intended to hurt anybody. He has good plans, good thoughts, good things. Then the question ought to be is why ain't I seeing them then? That ought to be a logical question. Well, we know right off the bat it ain't God's fault because he's telling us what he has planned for us and he's not a man that he should lie. So we'll get into that a little bit. He says, I will give you hope and a good future. Another version says there, if you're following along, to give you an expected end. God has an expected end for you. 
He expects you to accomplish these things in your life. He's given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. He's given you the Holy Spirit to indwell you. He's given angels to minister to you. He's given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. He has an expected end and he's cheering you on. That's the God we serve. He's not out to hurt you. Will he correct you? Yes. Why? Because he loves you and doesn't want to see you going astray. Because he knows where that leads to. Proverbs 1.23 says this, Turn to me and receive my gentle correction. Watch, and I will pour out my spirit on you. I will share with you my wise words in order to redirect your lives. God wants to redirect your life. Isn't it amazing how we think we know what's best for us? We really do. I did a lot of stupid things in my younger days because I thought I knew it all and I was just my guy. Thank God I got woke up in my late 20s or I'd be dead with like some of my friends that I hung around with back then. Do not think more highly of yourself as you ought to think, but think soberly, scriptures say. You don't know it all. I don't know why, why we tend to think we do, especially when we get older. When we get older, all we have is more life experiences to look at. But I don't know about you, I've still made some foolish decisions along the way and I try to avoid those because I don't like the costs that come along with it because consequences come with everything. But he says he's going to share his wise words with us. That's why we are to be readers of the word for instruction and knowledge to know things that we don't know. People don't know there's only one way to heaven. His name's Jesus. People don't know that. People don't know he has good plans for you. People don't know he has an expected end. They don't know that you're cheering him on. He's not mad at you. But he corrects those that he loves, just like we correct our children. Now notice this next phrase is what we want to touch on now. It's up there. The word of God is prof profitable for discipline and obedience. What does that mean? I, I broke it down into two phrases and I was going over this when I looked up the actual definition in the dictionary. The Spirit of God was just giving me scriptures to go with it. This is basically a spiritual definition, if I could put it that way. It was pretty cool. Discipline means this. How do we define it? It's this training. Expected to produce, expected to produce a specific character or pattern of behavior, especially training that produces moral and, or mental improvement. So discipline is training which actually has a result. So it talked about producing character. James 1, 2 through 4 says this, don't run from the tests and hardships, brothers and sisters. Don't run from them. As difficult as they are, you will ultimately find joy in them if you embrace them. We've been told to run from pain, run from suffering. We've been told all that to the devil. No, a lot of your pain and suffering is self-induced. Can I just be blunt? You're done dumb. You put wrong stuff in the eyes and the ears. You've listened to wrong things, watched wrong things, put bad things in the pie hole. And you wonder, why is my head messed up? Why is my body messed up? Self-induced. It says, but when difficulties come, non-self-induced one, because you can correct those, your faith will blossom under pressure and teach you true patience as you endure. And true patience brought on by endurance will equip you to complete the long journey and cross the finish line, mature, complete, wanting nothing. When trials come into your life, 
it's an opportunity to say, thank you, Lord. You're producing character in me. The one thing people don't have today is character. A man getting in the political arena like I am, there is no character. There is no integrity in people's lives. They blow with the wind. They take polls and see what's popular. It's amazing. How do you live like that? How do you know how to act differently when you're with all these people? I told you, I made a decision long ago, I'm just going to be me. I'm not smart enough to be all these different folk in all these different places. What you see is what you get. Here standing in the pulpit, but down at the Nottingham Transfer Station, you're going to see what... Or at the Northwood State Transfer Station, you're like yesterday. What you see is what you get. That's the way it ought to be in your life. You know one way when you go to work, one way when you come to church, one way when you go shopping? No. You're a son of the living God. Act that wherever you're at. But understand when the pressures come, when somebody acts, he gets up in your face and says, do you believe this about abortion? Yeah. It ain't right. It ain't health care. Because there is no care because somebody dies. That ain't care. That's a killing. Doesn't matter who's standing in front of me. Well, you ain't got no say because you're a man. Yeah, I got plenty of say. You got say, I got say. But that's what I mean. People don't stand under, people don't stand under the trying so it will produce endurance in you, so it will produce joy in the life because you know how many people are really looking for the truth and all they're doing is speaking out of ignorance because that's all they know? And it's the truth that's going to set them free. And we need to stand in the truth and speak the truth because it's the truth that sets them free. We don't got to be rude. We don't got to be ignorant about it. You know, I was reading John chapter 8 this morning. And when the Pharisees were going after Jesus, they started attacking his character and saying, Who do you think you are? You're not even 50 years old. And you say you were Moses? How many people tell you, what are you, holier than thou? Who do you think you are? Do you understand all that is just a tool of the enemy to get you to back down? I know who I am. Why are you asking me? I know. Who are you? In fact, I know who you are too. We can fix that issue for you. The Bible says you can cast out demons. Would you like me to help you with that one? So again, when the pressure comes... Stand. Because understanding, when you endure to the end, it's going to equip you when you cross the finish line. You're going to be mature, complete, wanting nothing. Do you understand Christ is coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle? I think that fits into the mature, complete, and wanting nothing category. But not only that, it's to change a pattern of behavior. Ephesians 5.1 says, watch what God does and then do it. Watch what God does and then do it. Like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. It's easy to just believe, behave like the father. It's real easy. Because that's what discipline is. Again, it's expected to produce a specific character and pattern of behavior. The pattern of behavior is Christ-likeness. Be like Jesus. You shouldn't be asking, what would Jesus do? You should know what Jesus would do. Sometimes he flipped tables. Sometimes he cast out demons. Sometimes he helped the poor. Sometimes he healed blind eyes. You know what Jesus did. If you get in the Word, you know what he did. You don't have to ask a question. But learn that kind of behavior. But then it says produces moral and mental improvement. Moral and mental improvement. We've got to get some more morality back in the body of Christ. More morality back in the body of Christ. Ephesians 4, 17 and 19 says this, I tell you this in the name of the Lord. You must not live any longer like the people of the world who don't know God. Their thoughts are foolish. When somebody meets you and they talk to you for any length of time, they ought to know that you're not like the people of the world. 
They ought to know there's a difference. Why? Because mor uh, morality and character has changed. They ought to know. Then it goes on to talk, and it's talking about them. Their minds are in darkness. They are strangers to the life of God. This is because they have closed their minds to him and have turned their heart away from him. That's the thing. People come with a closed mind about God. And they turn their heart away from him. Do you understand it's the goodness and kindness of God that leads people to repentance? Not Christians getting up in their face yelling at them and telling them how dirty, rotten sinner they are and they're going to hell. Now that's true, but that's not a good approach. That's not a conversation starter, let's put it that way. You know what a conversation starter is? Let me tell you what God's done in my life. You know, give me a testimony. Hey, I was a drunk man. I was so bad. I was hooked on drugs and alcohol. And you know what? I beat that drug thing, but that alcohol thing, I couldn't beat. And one night I just prayed to God, said, you take this thing away from me, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And boom, woke up the next morning and I have been set free for 40 years now. Ain't touched a drop since. Even after Mary died, I told you I thought came into my mind to go get drunk. That scared me. And it had been 30 years since, 30 some odd years since I quit drinking then. Just there, it scared me the thought could come in my mind. But people need to hear these things because people are bound and hopeless and they don't understand there is a way out. And his name is Jesus. But he's not, they're not going to see the way out in our lives if we're not joyful, we're not excited, we're not happy, and we're not sharing those things with people. To stop living like they did. It's a day of strangers to the life of God. Verse 19, they don't care anymore about what is right or wrong. They have turned themselves over to the sinful ways of the world and are always wanting to do every kind of sinful act they can think of. We all been there. Praise God, He saved us from that kind of life. So why would you go back into something that we, you know enslaves you? So again, there ought to be a change of moral character. We've got to discipline ourselves. We have to train this flesh in our mind. See, the only reason why you keep doing those things that you want to get rid of is because you've not made a decision to say, I'm never going to do it again. That's why. There's always an option. And probably the crux of the matter is right here. This it says discipline and obedience. Let me give you the definition of obedience. I found this pretty interesting. Obedience is a form of social influence. If you're following the notes, I put this spiritual. Because we're talking about spiritual. So I want you to understand it's also spiritual influence that involves performing an action under the orders of an authoritative figure. Under the authority, a person of authority, you obey what they're telling you to do. That's obedience. And as I put there, God. It differs from compliance and conformity. Notice compliance, which involves changing your behavior at the request of another person. We see that happen in churches. We request that all women wear dresses. We request all y'all use the King James Bible. It's a request of a person. It's different than obedience. I want to touch on that in a minute. And then and conformity. It's different than conformity. We've got to understand obedience, compliance, and conformity are three different things. Conformity means this. This involves altering your behavior in order to get along with the rest of the group. Well, you know, we all got this women's group in church, and if you're going to be part of this church, you need to go to the women's group. Conformity. We want everyone to conform. All look the same, act the same, talk the same, squawk the same. Do you understand we're all individuals before God, and there's never going to be another one like you? Never. 
That's why it's an expected end for you because you're the only one that can complete that end. So let me just share this scripture with you before we get into something that I hope you really understand and, and your eyes are open to. So performing an action under the orders of an authority figure. In Romans, at Romans, Matthew 28, 18 to 20, this is a New Living Translation. It says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. So who has all authority? Jesus. So when we become born again, we make Jesus the Lord of our life. We don't become born again by saying magic words of a magical salvation prayer. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is now your Lord, you're no longer your own Lord. You're saying, okay, Lord, I am going to put my life under your authority. And I'm going to confess with my mouth that God raised you from the dead. Then I'll be saved. So again, this is important to grasp because we've got to understand obedience, compliance, and conformity because they all get kind of blended together and they're not. So obedience deals with an authoritative figure. Jesus said, "All I have been given all authority in heaven and earth. He says in verse 19, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commandments, commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So obedience is this, I have submitted myself under your authority, Jesus, you have all authority, now you've given me a command. See, he's not given us a request that we're going to comply under. He's given a command because he has all authority. He has the authority to make the command. He has the authority to back up what he's telling you to do. Because remember the Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. Why? Because he has the authority to back it up. So he tells us to go and do what? Make disciples. He didn't tell you to win souls. He said make disciples. What is a disciple? One that becomes a follower of Jesus. Make followers of Jesus. Don't make religious, I don't know what the word is, but we'll just leave it there, you know what I'm saying. Cookie cutter individuals. Make disciples, make followers of Jesus, and you know what, all those followers are gonna look different and act different and follow different because we're all on different paths. God never took away our individuality. So he says, go and do that and then teach them. Teach the, these new disciples what? To obey. That's high on the list. Obey. Now let's talk about compliance a second. We saw a great example of this during the pandemic. Notice compliance is a request by another person. Okay? Compliance is a request by another person who really doesn't have the authority to back up what they're asking you to do. Because I remember back in the day going into Walmart during the face mask days. I really wigged out one old lady. I kind of felt bad. Because you know, you walked in the door. Here she is way on the other side by the exit door. And I come walking in, she's sitting on her walker, you know, the walkers that have the seat, she's sitting there against the wall, and she yells at me, literally yells at me from across the way, hey, you need to put on a mask. So you know what I did? I walked right over to her. You should have saw her face when I got close to her, her eyes got that big. And I says, I'm sorry, ma'am, I'm not gonna yell at you like you just yelled at me, but no thank you. And I walked in the store. She wanted me to comply, but she had no authority to back up what she was telling me to do. No authority. That's what compliance is. 
Compliance is somebody who doesn't have the authority trying to influence you and tell you how you ought to be doing and how you ought to be living. Guess what? I don't have the authority to tell you how to live and what to do. That's why I told you guys, I'm not going to tell you what to do. There you go. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I am not your Lord. There's only one Lord, and his name's Jesus. I ain't telling you what to do. I can tell you what's worked for me. I can tell you my understanding and revelation right now of the scriptures. But I'm not going to tell you how to live it out. We're not supposed to comply. Let me see if I missed anything here. See, compliance is entirely upon the person whom the request is made. Unfortunately, believers function in the same manner when they read the Word of God. Understand, God does not make requests. He demands obedience. When He says, go into all the world and make disciples, it's not that you're supposed to comply. You are supposed to obey. Wherever you are and whatever you're doing, you are supposed to be sharing Jesus with folk. Not even have to share Jesus with folk in the sense, be a written epistle read by all men. Let his light shine. Know what that means? His glory. We are a reflection of who he is. And people ought to see that. When you come into a, a group of people, they ought to right off the bat notice something different about you. You know, you stand a little taller than they do. You might dress a little nicer than they do. You're going to talk differently than they do. The last one is conformity. We also saw this during the pandemic. Conformity means going along with or following the group in order to get along. Now, how we saw that in Walmart, too. You had some stranger come up to you and tell you, what are you doing, put a face mask on? Thank you, Lord, nobody ever did that to me. I would not be sanctified at that moment. I would probably be not walking in the shoes of Jesus at that moment. Because I get very upset with anybody else who thinks they have the right to tell me how to live my life. There's only one, and his name is Jesus. I told you that story when we went through that at Town Hall on the Select Board. They wanted to institute a mask mandate again at the public places. I looked at the guy trying to push it and say, what right do you even think you have to tell another person whether they ought to put that on or not? If they want to, great. Individual freedoms and liberties, great. But who do you think you are to tell another person? Where do you think you get that authority from? Dude in the Golden Dome. I'm going to see the boy face to face, I'm telling you. I'm going to be in the Golden Dome, and if I ever see him, I may go right up to him and ask him where he thought he got that authority from. Because there's only one authority on this earth, and his name is Jesus. Not you, not me. Jesus says, I have all authority in heaven and on earth. We need to walk in righteousness. And stand up for the truth because it's the truth that sets people free. It's not trying to get my own will. I mean, I used to get that thrown in my face. What is wrong with you? I had all the junk thrown in my face. No, I ain't conforming. I'm not conforming because it, it feels slimy even. You want to make me look and act like everybody else? I'm not like you. I don't understand why people can't even get that concept. We are all sovereign individuals. This country was founded on that. Exactly. And we tend to trust others because our heart is deceptive and wicked. No, it's really scary now, two, three years after it all, and all the tests and studies have come out, you still run into people doing that. Well, fine, you do you. I'm good with that. You do you. I'm all for your own freedom. So let me give you a takeaway. Discipline and obedience boils down to this. 
We all must train ourselves to obey the one who has the authority over us. It doesn't come natural, it doesn't come easy. We've got to train ourselves in this area of obedience. Remember, obedience is different than compliance and conformity. So now let me show you these three thoughts on how to kind of practically do that. The first one is a healthy fear of the Lord is the first key in training yourself to obey. Fear is different than being afraid. Fear is understanding who you are and who he is. He's God. Being afraid is getting repercussions for a wrong that you did. You're afraid of suffering a penalty for something you did wrong and you become afraid. You're not going to suffer the penalty because Jesus suffered for all your sins, past, present, and future. Correction is not a penalty. Correction is a good thing because he don't want to see you go to hell. He wants to keep you on the straight and narrow. It says in Luke 12, 5, you can read the context if you like. It says, I will show you the one to fear. This is a new century version. Fear the one who has the power to kill you and also to throw you into hell. Yes, this is the one you should fear. You fear because you understand God has the authority to back that up. That's why it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That's why justice first starts in the house of God. We can't be no nonchalant and I don't know what other words to use. When it comes to God, there needs to be a healthy respect and awe of who He is. He's the creator of all things. The second practical principle is this. Always keep an attitude of humility. Matthew 18, 4 in the Passion Translation says this. Whoever continually humbles himself. Another version says this. To see, no, this is how it expands it. To see yourself as unimportant in your own eyes. You've got to see yourself as unimportant in your own eyes. Yeah, I was talking with the fire chief this week. We got some things going on. And he made this comment. He said, you know what? Nobody is irreplaceable. He says, once I'm no longer in this chair, somebody else will be sitting here. I know that. The problem is some people think they are. Some people think that the department will fall apart if they're not here. And we had one such person to think that. And they ain't been there almost two months. And guess what? We're still going strong. And guess what? He might not be there much longer anyway. No, you are not that important in the grand scheme of life. That's why it says in Romans, think, don't think so highly of yourself. No, you can have the right attitude about yourself. Am I a child of the king? Absolutely. Am I blessed? Absolutely. Am I blessed to be a blessing? Absolutely. But the thing here, it says, to see yourself in your own eyes as being that important. No. You know, touch on that in the last point. It says, whoever continually humbles himself to become like this little child to become childlike where you totally rely on your Heavenly Father for everything. Remember when you were a little kid, five years old, you thought Dad could do everything. Dad could walk on water. Dad and Mom. You relied on them for everything. You didn't think that you could, you could make your own living, make your own meals, anything, wash your own clothes. You relied on mom and dad for everything. What happened when we got older? We can't, why can't we bring that same attitude towards our Heavenly Father? That's what this is really talking about. You humble yourself to the place where you know it's not me, it's Him. The only reason why I exist, it says in Galatians, is because Christ lives in me. I'm dead. The only reason why I'm alive is Christ has lived me. Nothing to do with me. It's all about Him. And then it goes on to say, is the greatest one in heaven's kingdom realm. 
You want to be great in the eyes of God? Humble yourself. Don't belittle yourself. Don't degrade yourself. Have a healthy understanding of who you really are. And the last one is this. Always remember it's all by grace. It's all by grace. Unmerited favor. Nothing you can do to earn it. 1 Corinthians 4, 7 says this. Who made you better than your brother? Or what do you have that has not been given to you? If God has given you everything, why do you have pride? Why do you act as if he did not give it to you? And Ephesians 4, 7 says this. But each of us was given grace according to the measure in which Christ allotted it. Reminds me of the talents. He gave one five, one three, one one. Why? He knew what they could handle. You need to learn what you can handle. But you know what's good? You can expand your capacity. How? By developing your soul. By allowing him to transform your mind. By taking these truths. By reading the scripture from a posture of revelation saying, you know what, God? I can truly discipline myself to the place of obedience. I'm not going to comply. I'm not going to conform. I'm going to obey you because you are the authority in my life. I've told you before, too many, too many folk have made their job the authority, a spouse the authority, their kids especially an authority in their life. Grandkids, whatever. Some people even, their pets, I mean, they've elevated them to an unhealthy place of authority and anytime you elevate something to an unhealthy place of authority, you are devaluing God in your life. Now, God, the only reason why I can stand here and do what I'm doing is because of you. The only reason why I can be out there and win an election as a selectman because of you. The only reason why I'm going to be a state rep is because of you. Now, why? Because that's my expected end. Because you want me to bring righteousness and holiness into the governmental realm. It's obvious. Am I qualified? Heck no. In the world's eyes? You kidding me? I used to joke and say, I'm the Donald Trump of Northwood. I run from one election and win. Just like he did. He never ran before. He won the presidency. I mean, am I quali when I sit around, I'm like, no, I don't know what's going on. But you know what? God says this. He says, you know what? Don't fret because in the time of your need, I will fill your mouth. And you'll know what to say because you know why? I'm not there for me. I'm not there because I'm qualified. I'm there because he wants me to be there to be his reflection of his glory to that realm, to those people. I've run into so many different people now I never would have ran into just being five years ago the pastor of Destiny Christian Church. I've been able to run into more people and influence more lives than I ever did just standing here and doing all the stuff we used to do on Sunday morning and Sunday night before and Wednesday night at the old building and men's group and men's breakfast and all that junk. Now how much impact I had compared to what I got now? Why? I want you to reflect my glory out there. Go into the world and make disciples. That's not just for me, guys. That's for you, too. Jesus said, I got all authority. The question's going to be, are you going to obey? The question really comes down to, has you made him Lord of your life? Have you allowed him to be the authority in your life to tell you what to do, when to do, and how to do? Now, being a very independent, rebellious child growing up, I didn't let anybody do that. But when I met Jesus, and I knew he had the authority, no, it did it for me. He personally touched me. I just told you, he took the alcohol away like that. I mean, instantly. 
You've heard that before, 14, 15 hours of straight drinking. Went to bed two in the morning, woke up at eight in the morning, and the first thing that scared me was my eyes opened, I could see clearly, and I didn't have a hangover. That shocked me. That had never happened in my life ever. And then to go downstairs and flipping through the TV and put this preacher on and then just start watching him. I didn't even realize what I was doing. And my mom come in and looked at me, looked at the TV and walked back out. And my dad walked in and said, Jim, do you believe everything that guy's saying? I said, Dad, I guess I really do. He walked out and I'm sitting there thinking, what the heck happened to me? I go to bed blind drunk and I wake up completely different. But that's our God. That's why I've asked you before, what do you need God to do in your life to prove himself real to you? What do you need? He'll do it. No why he's all about wanting you. He loves you and wants you. And he'll do anything to get you. But not just that, he'll do anything to keep you. And he'll correct us. Keep us on the straight and narrow because he knows the alternative. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you. Father, I thank you for your presence in the house this morning. I thank you for your spirit that is touching hearts right now because you said your word would not return void but accomplish what you set it out to do. Lord, I don't know what that is, but you do. But Lord, I just pray that I've been faithful in sharing what you've put on my heart to share this morning and that we all can take that in whichever way we, we deal with it and we take it, Lord, that we may truly progress and grow in character and maturity. Our behavior will be changed, not because of some compliance or conformity, but truly out of obedience. Give us a fresh revelation of who you really are. The God of the universe, the most high God, the creator of all things. And the only reason why all this exists is because you exist. Give us a fresh look, a fresh glimpse of who you are in our lives. And Lord, once again, forgive us for straying, forgive us for doubting, forgiving us for taking you for granted and, and treating you like some genie in a bottle, only coming to you in our time of need. Lord, we love you, we worship you and praise you, and as we go from your house today, may we be challenged, stressed, stretched, but Lord, most of all, intrigued that we will spend more time in your word getting to know you better. And Lord, may our eyes of our understanding be opened and the devil no longer blind our eyes in certain areas in our life that we will see the light and the truth that we may be set free. And we honor you now, worship you now in the name of Yeshua. Amen and amen. Amen. Praise God.